Oh, oh my lord. Yeah, that's too loud. All right. Casual conversations over and you can okay. go with that. Do you want to talk into this thing? No. I don't know. I feel like Bill. And I can turn it down, just don't use that. Test, test. Test, test. Hello? I think that's, that's okay, isn't it? Can you, you can hear my voice anyways, right? Yeah, yeah kind of. That should be okay. okay. When things quiet down, it'll be all right. All right, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, and I'd like to thank the Environmental Resilience Institute for inviting me to present at the University of Indiana. I'm just kidding. I know you don't like that. It's Indiana University. We've got the same problem at Miami University. 
You know, if you tell like an old acquaintance that you work at Miami University, they'll be like, oh, I want to come visit you down in Florida where there's lots of fun to be had. And you have to say, no, no, this is Miami University, not the University of Miami, Miami of Ohio. And I'll show you a map. Here's Oxford, Ohio. And if you look a little to the left there, that's Indiana. So you know there's not a lot of fun to be had. <laughs> I made myself laugh. Uh, I'm from Wyoming. So I feel like I have kind of a, a right and even a duty to you know, tease any state that I enter. Because Wyoming has to be the least happening state, if you, if you exclude Yellowstone. Um, and then let me think. So I, I don't have a lot of invited academic, uh, academic talks because I'm kind of young. So it's just a handful right now. So I had to get on Google, find out, you know, Google has all the valid answers. So I said, how to give a successful invited academic talk. And it said, the first thing you do is make fun of the region. <laughs> and the second thing is, uh, you know, tell a political joke. So I prepared one. Mike Pence. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Uh, uh, so seriously, uh, I'm glad you came to my presentation. I really appreciate it. I'm very happy to be uh, presenting here. And sincerely, I hope I make your time uh, worthwhile and meaningful. And part of the point of the presentation today is to provide a series of reasons why you should be skeptical or even distrustful of people that try to convince you that we can uh, solve the problem of climate change primarily or wholly through technological fixes. And to be clear right away, the, the point is not that technological innovation is bad. Uh, instead, I try to make the case that we should think about technologies, like climate change relevant technologies, in social context, and that this has practical uh, consequences. And so the, the third part of the presentation, I'll touch on some uh, social changes we can make, uh, combined with a widespread adoption of renewables that would help um, rapidly reduce greenhouse gas emissions, potentially. And we can talk about whether these are relatively feasible and some of the political obstacles maybe during the discussion as well. I'll touch on a little, a little of that as well. Uh, one of the reasons um, I decided to speak on climate change in particular and why more and more of my research is directed in this area is partially due to, uh, you know, if you remember back from October, there was this uh, dire report released by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and if you remember further back from 2015, uh, during the Paris talks, uh, the parties of the agreement, these countries said, OK, let's try to stay below uh, 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And then there's strong language that uh, encouraging staying uh, uh, below, keeping warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And so the point of this uh, special report that was released in October was making the case that uh, it would be much less risky to set that 1.5 degrees target over the 2 degrees target. Because if we have, uh, according to this report, uh, some of the projections for uh, global warming of 2 degrees Celsius are uh, dire, uh, catastrophic. So one projection is the loss of some ecosystems. Uh, for example, the most commonly uh, discussed aspect of this report in terms of ecosystem loss is uh, the loss of greater than 99% of coral reefs. That's what's projected. Uh, the loss of the Greenland ice sheet, which would contribute to uh, flooding of uh, more coastal cities. Deadly heat waves, for example. Uh, cities in southern India are projected to be nearly uninhabitable in the summer. And I'm not an urban sociologist, but you know, southern Indian cities are even bigger than Ohio and Indiana combined. I'm just kidding, because it's not even comparable. I mean, we're talking about mega cities here, like 10, over 10 million people. Um, and then wa more water scarcity and uh, more food insecurity because of a higher prevalence and intensity of flooding and droughts. So one of the things I'll touch on today is the, the radical prescription of this report, uh, which in, in some ways uh, can be interpreted as vague, but on the other hand, it's fairly direct. Uh, because it says limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius would require rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. And you don't often read that in any sort of uh, mainstream climate report. It's hard to come by. So what does that mean? What would that entail? What kind of changes should we be talking about in terms of changing uh, different social structures? So we'll address that a bit today. 
And the other question that drives my research, and I think I'm more interested in this question maybe because I'm uh, in some ways uh, a bit perverted, because what really interests me is why we're not already doing that. You know, that we are knowingly projecting ourselves into a, a catastrophic future. And even in the US, when it, the dumbest country when it comes to climate change knowledge, uh, even the majority of the US recently uh, believes climate change is happening and it's primarily human cause. So you can't just blame information deficit like the organized fossil fuel denial movement. But usually how we think about human decision making, okay, people don't have all the information that they need, so if they have information, they'll make the right decisions. But we're still doing the exact same things uh, that we used to do with minor changes, and we're, we've done nothing really serious to address climate change. And why is that? And usually we just give gut, you know, gut answers to this question. But it's one of those questions that I think needs to be studied systematically, both at the global level, down to the individual uh, everyday fears and uh, feelings of helpless, helplessness that people have. So it's a serious question that requires uh, academic study, I think. So we'll also be addressing that question. And one of the reasons that I think that we don't seriously respond to climate change as we need to is we live by myths. Uh, I, I call them ideologies, but that's even a more pejorative term. And one of the myths I think modern people live by, including myself, is what I'll call later technological optimism. Uh, and that's the idea that, to, put, to oversimplify, that at some point in the future, it's maybe already happening, we will address climate change through the right application of technology or the wider scale adoption of technology. And that's all that we really need to do. We just have to wait for it. Um, and I think that sort of ideology, along with a number of other problems, is one of the reasons that we're not responding to climate change. So I'll make that case later, too. So what can we do to change society, and why aren't we doing this already? And I have this quote from Ulrich Beck, this uh, late, one of the last great sociologists uh, who died recently, German sociologist. And he, he frames the question this way, and I think this is actually a good way to frame the question, because some of the changes that we would have to make would be considered by current standards revolutionary changes in the very, the very way that societies function and how to deal with this issue. And he, uh, so why is there no storming of uh, the Bastille because of environmental destruction? Why is there no red October of ecology? So why aren't we facing the current climate crisis in the same way that humans used to approach large social issues? So it's, an int it's a question that fascinates me. So first, the, the perhaps the most abstract and uh, potentially boring, hopefully not boring, part of the presentation will be the first part. Uh, but it'll be short, and I'll try to be as concrete as possible. But it summarizes some of the key insights from the sociology of technology. And the point of doing that is to help us start thinking about technology in social context. Because we don't often do that, especially in climate change reports. Um, and then I'll summarize some of the risks and paradoxes that are associated with climate change relevant technologies, like the case for reductions in carbon intensity or uh, improvements in efficiency, uh, the adoption of renewables, and then more recently, the case for geoengineering. And then finally, uh, I'll outline some social changes that I think are relatively feasible and socially desirable that could uh, perhaps reduce greenhouse gas emissions at uh, the rate that we need to, to stay within a, even uh, modest climate change targets. And just to go back for a second, two degrees Celsius is already, it's not, it's not gonna happen. If I was a betting man, I, I would bet we would be closer to four or six degrees than two. Like two, two degrees is already, uh, it, it will be extremely difficult. So 1.5 degrees, uh, and the, the, what the report states is that we would have to start rapidly changing human society now. So I'll make the case later that the future is open and we could do it and there, we have the potential to do it. But keep in mind that two degrees Celsius is already a pretty low limit. So how do we stay within 1.5 degrees? Um, so th that's the question I ask for thinking about social changes that are relatively feasible and uh, so they're possible and uh, socially desirable. So first, again, the sociology of technology, uh, I'll be as concrete as possible and I'll explain why it's very relevant for thinking about solutions to climate change. So one reason you, think sh you should always think about technology in social context is that technology design is social. A different way to think about it is that technological innovation is a social process and it's a political process. You know, anthropologists always talk about 
uh, non-material culture, like values and norms and language and that kind of thing. And then they also talk about material culture. And then that brings to mind uh, the technologies uh, that used to be used in, in hunter-gatherer societies or agrarian societies. But that's exactly how you should think about your technological artifacts too. The different artifacts of modern society is material culture. And it, technology literally embodies the values of society in the sense that technology is, is a reflection of what we decide to do in the world. And in modern society, most technological innovation is driven by the, the structural need to maximize profits. And this is everything from productive technologies to the technologies that are designed. When you first hear the word today, you probably think of like your computer or phone to the gadgets that you buy in the marketplace, which are produced not to, not for you to use, first of all, it's produced, first of all, to make money. And so in, in terms of productive technologies, a really easy example of looking at material culture and kind of a reflection of uh, uh, the embodiment of values of society is if you look at animal agribusiness, how it's developed since after the first or the second world war. And so the goal of animal agribusiness today is to grow animals as quickly as possible uh, to the highest weight as possible to maximize profits. So all the technology that we use, we call it industrial animal agriculture, but industry is a secondary problem here because the, the types of things that we do with animals, like put them in gestation crates or the kinds of things that we put them there in their food to make them grow faster, all that has one goal, and that's to, to uh, increase profits. So th this is just one example. Um, but that's, we should think about technological design as a political and social process. It's a reflection of social values. So that's one reason to think about technology in social context. So keep that in mind. We'll, we'll explain why it's relevant to climate change soon. And second, technology adoption is social. So we, we often think that a group or a society is going to adopt a given technology because it's more effective or efficient, something like that. Um, but it's actually a, a social process. Whether or not a society adopts whatever technology you have in mind depends on who gets to decide and what, what are the values of that society. And a, a too easy example, of course, is uh, Amish people. You know, familiar with Amish people in Ohio and Indiana. And as you know, they avoid adopting a number of modern technologies because of the values of their society. So they avoid adopting uh, labor-saving technologies. Do you know why? It's actually kind of interesting. They still make, it'll make them too lazy because they value hard work. And so that, that's why they don't have labor saving technology. They don't have things like TV because they think it's too easy to access outside values. And it's too easy of an example, but you can just think about the difference be, between like the US and the EU when it comes to GMOs. So the EU tends to, or at least in principle, abide by this idea of a precautionary principle in technology adoption, whereas the US principle, I'm not quite sure what it is. Just try it out and see if, see, see if bad shit happens. <laughs> it's more of, the, more of the model here. Um, so that, that, is, that is a social process. So technolo te technology is social in design and uh, adoption. And then the obvious ones, uh, especially technology has social impacts, but it also depends on how it's used. So most of us recognize that technology has impacts on society. So most of us you know, will know how social relations have changed with cell phones. It's hard to imagine the modern world without an airplane or birth control pills or nuclear weapons, that kind of stuff. So it has major social impacts. But it also depends on how it's used. Because on the one hand, technology sort of chooses projects that you're allowed to pursue if you use it. And this, this is antithetical to common sense, how we relate to technology in everyday life, which we think about as a bunch of stuff flying around, that we can kind of pursue any project that we want to with it. Uh, but the kind, it depends on the kind of technology, but some technologies are highly specialized in the sense that they're, they're value laden. So if you use a microwave, I mean, there's only so many things you can do with it. You're going to microwave something. If you, if you use it as a helmet, they might lock you up. or if you, I'm sure you, you could kill someone with it or something, but you're not going to use very many things with a microwave other than microwaving stuff. Um, a funner example is the, uh, the guillotine. Uh, during the French Revolution, they designed the guillotine. Uh, as a humane way, and this is a perfect embodiment of values, a humane way, so it's in line with reason, to kill everyone that was an enemy of the revolution. <laughs> you know, the aristocracy, people that weren't uh, radical enough, just chop their heads off. And the point here is that if you're using a guillotine, you're probably not using it to, you know, cut carrots for your salad. 
you're probably killing someone, uh, but it can't choose who you're going to kill, but that's what it's there for, and that's, if you're using it, that's what you're doing with it. So it orients values in a sense, if you're using it. On the other hand, some technologies have more flexibility in use if you think about them in social context. So in what social conditions can you use different technologies? And, and the best example is always uh, automation. So when you have uh, automated technology, there, some, some reports project there's going to be large, a large amount of technological unemployment. And then, of course, the response from economists is, well, this will also grow the economy, create new jobs, and they'll be reemployed in different sectors. Um, what's often missed in this discussion is that if we use uh, automation in different social conditions, we could actually use it to just make our life easier. It seems weird to us now, but it wasn't that long ago when people were worried that in the future, people would be really bored. That the problem of this time would be we'd all, we'd all be so bored because tech machines would be doing everything. And the thing is, machines really could do a lot of things and we could just work less. But the way that we use gains in productivity is we end up working more. Um, so, but it depends on who owns the technology and who gets to make decisions about it. And we'll return to that point later. So what does this have to do with climate change? Um, every climate change relevant technology is social in design, whether or not societies adopt it, uh, and then how we're going to use it and what social conditions and what kind of impacts it'll have. And so the use and impacts is what I'm focusing on in this presentation. But just think about in terms of adoption. Like if you look at my home state in, in Wyoming, I don't know if Indiana has anything like this, but fossil fuels in Wyoming basically run the show, including the university, and that, it, including policy about where electricity is going to come from. And they fight, they fight really hard to keep renewable energy out of the energy mix completely. <laughs> and that sounds to us absurd, because of course it makes technological sense, it makes sense in terms of climate change just to, you know, uh, of course tra transition to renewables. But that, that is a political process itself too. So it's people fighting for their interests and what they want for the future. So that's all, that's all a political and social process. So now that we have some assumptions about technology in place, uh, we can move on to this. Um, one way to frame this portion of the talk is a critique of technological optimism in climate politics. Uh, so what does that term technological optimism mean? This is sort of, this definition is somewhat of an overstatement. This might, this would be like a hard technological optimism, you know, among like economists, but I don't know who else is that crazy. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Uh, so are there any economists here? Okay, we can make fun of economists. Um, the, the idea, because that's where this term came from, was the economists with discussions with the neo-Malthusians from the 70s. You know, the neo-Malthusians, the limits to growth, human populations are too big, and economists were like, ah, we always create new stuff, and new technologies will be fine. That was, that's where this, the, this term came from, was out of that debate. So technological optimism, and th this is an overstated definition. Uh, the idea that for any problem, environmental problem that we have, we'll have some sort of uh, technological breakthrough that will solve the environmental problem. And maybe we can overcome natural limits in the process. Uh, and I say it's an overstatement because not many people believe that, but in mainstream environmentalism, climate change reports, uh, news discussions of climate change, there is uh, what you could call a softer form of techno-optimism uh, as a very consistent theme. Um, and so this portion of the presentation will touch on why you should distrust that faith in technology. But there's three broad reasons for why you should distrust this faith in technology and environmentalism as a whole. One reason is that almost every environmental problem, and there are exceptions to this, are caused through uh, social processes and often driven by basic social structures. And if you're going to solve those environmental problems, you have to figure out what are those social causes so you can actually address it. And there's exceptions to this. But usually, these exceptions are just banning some sort of technology. Uh, that's one of the, one of the techno fix that usually does the trick if, if it's really just a technological problem, is you just end up banning a technology. But it's rare, and there are exceptions, that you can just have some sort of technological solution to an environmental problem. Uh, a second reason you should be skeptical of technological optimism in environmentalism as a whole is that almost all technological applications to solve environmental problems have some sort of unintended consequence. And when these are, are vaguely known, what could happen 
or it's uncertain what could occur in the future if we use a technology, we call them risks. And I'll touch on some risks associated with geoengineering projects uh, later on. And then a third reason, and probably the funnest reason to uh, study, is that the third reason you should be skeptical of technological optimism and environmentalism is that technologies have paradoxical or even ironic outcomes where you have the opposite effect of what you intended to happen when you uh, tried to use the technology in the first place. And one of the best examples of this is the Jevons paradox. Um, and there is a common assumption in climate change reports and uh, news discussions of climate change and, and how we talk about climate change in everyday life, that if we reduce carbon intensity, which is another way of saying improving efficiency, that will reduce uh, uh, carbon emissions. The problem is, is there's a lot of research that shows that as you increase efficiency in, in various kinds of resource use, including energy, sometimes you increase, or it's associated with increases in total resource use and or energy use. And if there isn't an, uh, an increase, there's always going to be some kind of what's called a rebound effect, where part of the potential gains in this, these efficiency gains are eaten up due to gains in efficiency. And this paradox comes from uh, this 19th century econ economist, William Stanley Jevons, and he discovered that as we increased efficiency in coal use, we ended up increasing total coal production, and there's a relationship between those two variables that we'll talk about in a second. So why is this happening? Why do you have this counterintuitive uh, outcome. Uh, one, one reason is direct. So you, when you have, so you have a direct causal relation between increases of efficient, inefficiency and increases in resource use, or at least some kind of rebound effect. When you increase efficiency, and that's what we mean by the word efficiency, in, including the word intensity, is you save money. And when you save money, you have to spend it somewhere, and sometimes you spend it on that resource that you were originally producing in the first place, or consuming. Uh, to give a really simple uh, individual consumer side example, let's say you go out and buy a Prius and then you save money at the pump and even if you're not consciously doing it, you end up driving more because you have this extra money and you end up driving more because you have the extra money. But a more pernicious cause is uh, an indirect effect and this is when you, same thing, I'll give the Prius example again, you save money at the pump so you have more money and you end up spending it on something. And the thing about when you spend money, unless you spend it on, I don't know, donating to Greenpeace or all the fine things that most of us do with all of our money is just burn it or donate to environmental organizations. Uh, you spend it somewhere. You go on a vacation. If I had a Prius and I saved money, I'd go on vacation. And as a survey show, if you had, hey, if you had extra thousand, two thousand bucks, what would you do? Everyone would go on vacation. And if it's, a, you know, if it's by air, you can see why this becomes a problem. So you end up spending this money on other resources. So it's an indirect effect. And then there's the biggest problem, which is structural. And this is related to what Jevons found that when firms increase efficiency, so when firms tell you, hey, we're increasing efficiency, we're driving down carbon intensity, that kind of thing, all it means is that they're reducing costs. Uh, and then when you reduce costs, it increases profits and they invest it back in the production process. And this can increase total resource use. So the point isn't that efficiency is bad or we shouldn't in decrease carbon in uh, intensity, but that the, if you think about technology and how we use it socially, there's there's some clear paradoxical effects. And likely some of you have heard of the Jevons paradox already. There's a less discussed uh, and paradox that needs a lot more research. It's been called the energy boomerang effect, and it's associated with renewables, as well as, as, well as decreases in intensity. Um, and before, before I do the next two slides, I should be clear that I, I, I have no problems with renewables. I'm 100% in favor, like any sane person, of transitioning to renewables. Um, and, there, and the limitations of renewables are primarily due to how they're used in, or how they're used in current social conditions. And if we change those, which I'll discuss later, we could change the kind of impacts that renewables have. But there is, and this is probably the most common argument in every climate change report and every day discussions about climate change and uh, media framings of climate change, is that if we transition to renewables, uh, if we transition to alternative energy, uh, we'll solve the climate change problem. But because technology is social, we shouldn't assume that developing a unit of alternative energy will displace or replace a unit of fossil fuel based energy. But that assumption is made in every major climate change report, that if you develop renewables, you know, that's a common argument, let's develop renewables, 
The idea is that that will just replace units of fossil fuel-based energy. But no one ever questions if that actually happens. And that one of the only person that does is this guy named Richard York at, at uh, University of Oregon. And he studied empirically if this actually happens, and he found that it doesn't. There's only a very modest displacement of uh, fossil fuel-based energy by renewables. Um, and for, in terms of electricity, just as an example, uh, so, something like a unit of uh, renewable-based electricity displaced like one-tenth of a unit of fossil fuel-based energy in the last 50 years in most countries. That's tiny. And if, if we take climate change reports seriously, that we can just develop renewables and that will solve the problem, that's obviously not, it's not happening now, or it hasn't for the last 50 years. And this is associated with what uh, has been called uh, by this guy in this book, Zenner, uh, the energy boomerang effect. And this is uh, that reductions in carbon intensity, and this is due to additions of renewable energy, as well as transitioning to more efficient, efficient forms uh, like gas. So it's, it's also a Jevons paradox uh, that you, all have, you have increases in energy use. So you have uh, less carbon intensity, but more energy use. And we don't want that. And I'll explain why soon. So why is it, the, the interesting question is, why is this happening in the first place? Why don't you have a displacement of fossil fuel energy by renewables because you're developing renewables? The biggest problem is we just keep extracting fossil fuels and burning them. And it sounds very, I mean, it sounds obvious that you should, okay, we're developing renewables, we'll get rid of fossil fuels, but what's not often discussed is how exactly we're going to suppress fossil fuel extraction and consumption. And this recent, I, for, I forgot to put the whole citation here, but this recent paper by Richard York and uh, Shannon Bell, it was, I think it was published like a month ago in Energy Research and Social Science, uh, and I'll, I'll explain what's going on here because it's probably not too close to you guys. Uh, and it's called Energy Transitions or, uh, or Additions. And the paper makes the case that there really hasn't ever been an energy transition. Because this is what we usually look at, this figure. And this is the percentage of global energy consumption from different sources. So this is biofuels, is blue, and red is coal. So we usually think about that as an energy transition due to the rise of coal. And then you have uh, oil and gas picking up and coal declining a little bit. And then you have uh, increases in hydrogen, increase in nuclear until people got a little disillusion with it and it decreases. That's what we usually look at. But this is what we should be looking at, and this is total energy consumption by different sources. And what you see is all sources almost always increase all the time. And so the paper the, makes the case that there hasn't really been an energy transition. There's just been a continual addition of new sources to the energy mix. We're just constantly adding new forms of energy. And that's, that's a problem. Something else to note about these figures is, you know, the best forms of renewables, wind and solar, don't even register. Like, they, they aren't even on here. You have hydro and biofuels, uh, but you don't, wind and solar don't even register on this at all. And related to this and why there might be a direct relationship or causal relationship between uh, increase in renewable energy and increases in total energy use is if you're not reducing fossil fuel development at the same time, you're, you're just going to increase the energy mix, which, of course, economists can tell us something, that if you increase supply, you reduce costs, and you spur demand. So th there could be a direct causal relationship, and more research that needs to be done here. But what is clear is that this is happening, and that's a problem. And then finally, to, to say the obvious, another obvious point that isn't always discussed, is that the reason that we're developing renewables at this time anyway, is not to conserve energy anyways. Like if you're an energy company, that you don't want to be put out of business. You're not developing energy to conserve energy. That's the worst business model possible. <laughs> It'd be like prisons wanting to you know, stop having criminals. It'd be idiotic. Uh, so the point is to increase profits the whole, the whole time. So we're, we, if we're going to address this problem, we again, as we'll talk about later, have to start talking about ownership and control. So the case for renewables and the case for energy efficiency are probably the most common forms of soft techno-optimism in environmental politics. And again, I'm not against a tra transition to renewables. I'm not, a, I'm not a fossil fuel rep or something. And I'm, uh, of course, for increases in 
efficiency in most cases. Geoengineering, on the other hand, and, and the, it matters that we talk about these in social context is the point. Geoengineering is probably the most uh, fantastic form of technological optimism today. Uh, geoengineering refers to, have you heard of geoengineering? Even Vox just had an article that made it look, you know, Vox has articles that makes it look cool. They, they have one finally. It makes, me, it makes me nervous. And I'll tell you why. Uh, not, not both forms, but one form in particular makes me really nervous. Uh, so geoengineering refers to these gigantic deliberate attempts to engineer the entire climate system to address some of the uh, uh, most uh, serious impacts of climate change. And there's two different forms. One's called uh, solar geoengineering or solar radiation management. And that, these are different techniques to redirect incoming solar radiation uh, before it in, comes into the atmosphere. And the other form is called uh, carbon geoengineering or carbon dioxide removal. And this is one that sounds awesome. Is you just suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. That'll take care of the problem. I mean, that sounds great. And some, some of them, are, th these kind of excite me, but they're really limited. These scare the hell out of me. And so I'll talk about two examples from each uh, that are commonly discussed. Uh, in, in the solar radiation management strategy, these are stratospheric aerosols in this kind of simplified figure. And the, uh, stratospheric aerosol injection, or SAI, is an attempt to emulate volcanism. You know, when volcanoes erupt, and it reduces, sometimes it can reduce global average temperatures for short periods of time. It's because of uh, uh, sulfate particles going to the uh, stratosphere. And so scientists are like, well, we, should, we can do that. <laughs> that, that that's, that's kind of the, the logic behind it. And you could do it with ground cannons or air balloons, and there's a bunch of different ways that you could inject uh, uh, sulfate aerosols into the stratosphere. And uh, as you can imagine, the biggest limitation of this approach is it is just extremely risky. And if you look at risks and in, in, uh, analyses of this approach, it's, it's like a laundry list of risks because we just don't know what would, they have no idea what would happen. Even uh, people like David Keith, which are some of the biggest spokes uh, people for this approach, um, he's, he's making the case that we should do more research. Uh, not, not to deploy it yet, just uh, let's learn more knowledge about this. And there's a case against that as well. But, and he says it's a very scary way forward. So, it, so the major spoke people are even nervous about this approach. Um, and just to give you one of the risks, uh, it's called the termination effect. And it might not be one that you think about immediately. So you might think, how would this affect weather patterns? You know, we don't know how to affect precipitation. And then if you don't know how something affects precipitation, then what about waterways and food systems and all that? Uh, but a, an effect that you might not think about is called the termination effect. And so let's say we had an SAI program. So all, all the countries meet, got together, and like they usually do, they come to an agreement right away. <laughs> Just kidding. So that's another, you know, how would, this, how would this take place? So they come to an agreement, and then they, have, they say, okay, let's do this SAI program, and then we have it for a couple decades. And then what I think we would do is we'd probably just keep doing what we're doing already. This would be kind of an excuse to just keep uh, the status quo, because we'd be doing, doing SAI, and then we'd keep driving around and, and consuming uh, lattes and doing all that. And then, let's say there's a technological failure, so we can't keep this program going, or there's geopolitical tensions, and this program can't be up, up kept. And then, all of a sudden, we have SAI goes away, and then all this incoming solar radiation would enter the atmosphere, and we've been burning fossil fuels the entire time. Uh, you would have, according to computer models, you'd have rapid uh, and, and uh, intense warming, like, like four degrees Celsius, very rapidly. And that would be catastrophic for ecosystems, and it'd, it'd, it'd just be catastrophic. That, that's one of the most serious risks, is if you, what, after you start something like this, you can't stop. Um, and then with carbon dioxide removal, it's just a different monster entirely. Uh, the, the um, who was it? The National uh, Sciences released uh, one of the, spe you know how they do sp special reports all the time? They did it on the, uh, geoengineering, and they have separate reports for solar geoengineering and a separate report for carbon geoengineering. And then if you watch the, uh, uh, they have their uh, lecture and presentation of the report, the guy calls this spraying uh, uh, perfume on trash, and this one taking out the trash. So you can see which, which kind of approach they prefer. And one of the most commonly discussed carbon uh, dioxide removal strategies is uh, direct air capture. And this would be 
pulling carbon dioxide directly out of the atmosphere and, pump, and storing it underground. The problems with this approach right now is it's way too expensive, and the companies that are developing this strategy are trying to make it profitable. And a different, a different related one is called post-combustion carbon capture and storage, and then at power plants you attach, this is, this is a sociologist idiot talking, attach a hose to it, and then, and then it's a, and that pumps it underground. And what they use it for, though, is they use it for what's called enhanced oil recovery. And so they would use all this captured CO2, pump it underground to all these areas that they couldn't get oil out of, and then get the oil out and then burn it. So they're trying to figure out how to make it profitable. It's not scalable right now. And it, to make it profitable and scalable, it, it would take quite a while. And even according to the industry, it's going to take a long time. So those are two big problems. Uh, right now, it's also really energy intensive. A lot of these strategies aren't uh, carbon negative, which would just mean we'd end up using more energy to operate them. And if you, David Keith is starting a company that's, that's trying to develop direct air capture, and he just says, well, we'll just put nuclear plants next to it to power. So you can see why all, you know, all of these different approaches are, have limits. And then there's a number of risks associated with storage and the technology itself. So right now, it's, it's too pricey. It's, there's risks associated with it. It's not scalable. This, I think, will be, like I say here, we've, I've written a couple papers with colleagues about this. And I should mention that Diana Stewart and Brian Peterson, I've developed a lot of these ideas together and kind of summarizing climate politics. I forgot to say that at the beginning. But, uh, but we've written a couple papers, and we make the case that really solar geoengineering is, if it in political context, even though the, the scientists themselves are nervous about it and they say, well, we should reduce greenhouse gases at the same time, but you know what's going to happen. If, if this technology is viable and it, becomes, uh, it enters political discussion, you know they're going to, you can keep doing, the, the way you sell it is you say we can keep doing what we're doing. That's how it would be sold. And I think, I think that's how it would operate in social context. That's, that's just a prediction. But I think that discussion will definitely increase. And another framing of stratospheric aerosol injection that I don't like very much is the idea that they're doing it for uh, developing countries. So it used to be, hey, it's really cheap, because it is really cheap compared to mitigation. That's why it's discussed all the time. This is really cheap. And it's a great techno fix. That's how it used to be sold. Now, oh, now it's for uh, poor Bangladeshi farmers. That's why we're developing this technology. So you'll see the frame switch as well. It, that discussion is interesting and terrifying. So moving on. So if technology alone, so again, this isn't an anti-technology talk. If technology alone isn't going to solve the climate change problem, what kinds of changes can we make in, in social systems to have rapid, or achieve, I should say, achieve rapid and deep uh, emissions cuts? with the help of the adoption of renewable-based energy, a renewable energy. And so this final section, uh, one thing I, we can discuss later is if these are, are achievable and the political barriers. But for now, we'll just outline some relatively feasible, we can talk about what that means later, uh, changes that we can make. And we'll talk about degrowth. Have you heard, who's heard of the term degrowth? This polemical term for a little bit. Uh, and then concrete policy. So this is kind of an overarching arching uh, framework for thinking about social changes we can make, and then we'll talk about some concrete policy changes um, like work time reduction and nationalizing fossil fuel companies, and we might be able to talk briefly about uh, community energy or, or energy democracy projects in, in the European Union. So degrowth is, this, uh, as my colleague stated, is a literally unsexy term. Uh, and it's a polemical term that developed in France as a social movement and quickly developed into a field of study, especially in ecological economics. Uh, most of, a lot of the research is coming out of Spain uh, and Germany and, and France, but it's increasingly coming to the United States and some countries in Latin America. And the point is, uh, is not that we should reduce economic growth for the sake of reducing economic growth. The argument is that if we want to address global environmental problems like climate change, we have to stop sending more inputs into the social system, energy inputs and material inputs. And if we're going to reduce total inputs into the social system, we would have to reduce economic growth as measured by GDP, or the kind of changes that we would make would reduce economic growth. And that's a terrifying 
thing to say because in our society that we operate by what they call a growth fetish. The idea is that we need economic growth. Growth is good for everyone. It's what makes our lives so great and it benefits everyone. The problem with our current society is it's not that growth is good for everyone as we'll talk about soon. It's that it requires growth. You know, if, we don't, if, we, if our society doesn't grow about 3% a year, it's a problem. And if, and if it decreases in growth, it's a serious problem. You would call it a recession, and it's bad. So the, the degrowth program is making a case for designing an economy that doesn't require economic growth. So it's not about degrowing capitalist societies, because that's, that's bad. It would be some kind of post-capitalist society that we'd have to figure out how to design that doesn't require economic growth. Because capitalism, to say the, the scary C word, uh, is a system that constantly has to increase in size. And when I mean increase in size, I mean through energy and material throughput. It always has to. Uh, just with greenhouse gas emissions, I mean, a uh, percent increase in GDP is associated with something like 0.5 to 0.7 percent increases in greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, as one of the supporters of degrowth put it, it's, a, it's almost a fantasy to think that you're going to have an absolute decoupling of, of uh, uh, carbon emissions from GDP. It's a fantasy. But I hope, I hope he's wrong, and I hope I'm wrong, because I, I don't, we'll talk about how relatively feasible this is later. So already, and I say, I put, un, I put developed countries in scare quotes, not to be politically correct, but just because I think these countries are overdeveloped. The United States is over, an overdeveloped country. Because the kinds of things that we're, and it's not just a quantitative change in how much stuff we're producing, it's also a qualitative change in thinking about what we should produce and for what reason. And right now, in that sense, we're, we're an overdeveloped country in terms of what, what kinds of things we decide to produce. And countries like the United States, the kinds of changes we would have to make would decrease GDP by at least a third. And that sounds really scary, but that's not too far away from like 1960 or 1970s levels. But it sounds scary to us. At the same time, uh, in so-called developing countries, they probably would, to meet everyday needs, have to increase throughput for a while. So the question is, how do you do this without harming people? Because no, no one's going to get on board if it makes life worse. At this time, one immediate reason not to be extremely skeptical is that research shows that uh, we don't become any happier after a certain level of development, and we don't become any healthier after a certain level of development. So then the question is, you know, what is growth good for then? And it's hard, it's hard to come up with answers. Only in our society do we absolutely require growth to live a decent life, to, to have jobs and all that. So how do we start thinking about society that doesn't require growth? And so a brief comment on degrowth in technology, specifically alternative energy converters. So degrowthers, as they're sometimes called, aren't, not all of them, some of them are, some, but not, most of them are not like technophobes or something. Uh, they 100% support a transition to renewables, especially wind and solar. Uh, but they add really important qualifiers. One is that if we actually want to transition to renewables, 100% is probably unfeasible, at least for a long time but mostly transition to renewables uh, at, the, at the rate that we need to to stay within these climate targets is likely not feasible at, within like the next 10, 20 years just with transitioning to renewables, meaning we'd have to change social systems too and the size of economies. We'd have to conserve energy is a different, an old way of putting it. And that's because, again, to sound a bit like a fossil fuel rep, but the one thing they're not lying about is that fossil fuels are actually really unique. Uh, in the sense that they have uh, gigantic uh, power densities that you can, uh, or the amount of power you can extract from an acre. Like some power plants have something, I forget, like a thousand uh, watts per, per meter. And, and uh, the best solar panels are something like 20. And, they're not, and they have absolute limits of how, how, how effective they can become. And then you have th this energy return on energy invested index uh, fossil fuels are quite low. So how much energy it takes to put into uh, energy converters and how much you get out of it. And they're only going to be able to develop so much because they're a different kind of technology. Fossil fuels are pretty unique, these dead forests. 
Um, and a different way to think about this is carbon budget analysis. You know, carbon budget analysis is basically how many tons of carbon we can burn if we stu and stay within different uh, climate goals, like uh, uh, 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees. For 2 degrees Celsius, that target, uh, if we assume that developing countries are going to increase fossil fuel use for a while, we would have to decrease fossil fuels use, like the United States and the developed world, by like 8 to 10 percent per year for decades. And it's generally accepted among climate change economists uh, that anything more than 3 to 4 percent, like in the Stern report, is incompatible with economic growth. And I should also mention that th some of the best case scenarios for transitioning to renewables would be increasing renewables by like 3 to 4 percent per year. So I mean, it's, it's a problem. Or I should, excuse me, decarbonizing a best case scenario is 3 to 4 percent a year, excuse me. Um, and if, again, 100 percent renewable is probably not a viable goal right now, but something near 100% renewable, we would have to conserve energy and we would have to shrink growth as measured by GDP traditionally. And, and we'd also, the degrowthers make the case that we shouldn't even use that measure anyways. You know, GDP is always criticized. Uh, what, what famous person, the Kennedy guy, one of the Kennedys, said that GDP measures everything that no one cares about? Robert, Robert Kennedy? It do, it, what does it measure that you care about? You care about being happy and healthy Maybe with your, if you have kids or something taking care of them or your family and friends. It doesn't measure any of that. It just measures stuff that we consume. Uh, but we'd have to reduce total economic growth and conserve energy. That's, that's the qualifier. And those qualifiers usually aren't included. Uh, to give you, just to give you a, a concrete example, uh, from 2000 until now, uh, renewable, energies, uh, renewable energy increased, I forget how many... I don't want to give you a number because it'll be, I can't remember the number. The, the important part is, in, from now until, or 2000 until now, energy demand, new energy demand, not, not just already existing energy demand, only 16% was covered by renewables. And they, they increased rapidly during that time. And that's new energy demand created in that period. It was 16% covered by renewables. And that's on top of uh, old energy demand. So the idea that we're just going to start adopting renewables and it's going to replace uh, what we were able to do with fossil fuels is misguided. We'd have to, we just have to change how we operate in everyday life. And again, the question is, how do you do this without making life terrible? And you can. One option in a concrete policy proposal is work time reduction. And work time reduction is one way to reduce uh, economic growth is measured by GDP and conserve energy and increase social well-being. Not even maintain it, it would increase social well-being. And all work time reduction means is not individuals deciding to work less, because that's not going to do much of anything, but national level policies to change how many hours a week we're allowed to work, uh, how, mu how much parental leave we have, how many holidays we have. And then one, one policy I like the idea of, and I think it would sell well, is having Fridays off, or working four days a week, having three-day work weeks, and it would change for different people. And you have to be careful here, because bosses kind of like this idea, too. Because they'll just say, OK, then I won't give you benefits. That's perfect. Oh, we're doing that anyways. So the, the, the struggle would be, how do you maintain current benefits and even maintain current wages and reduce work time? So this would also be a political struggle, struggle and it would, have some, it would require some sort of renewed labor movement. Um, because, and the reason work time reduction should be taken seriously is, is it's associated with a number of environmental gains. So work time, shorter work hours are associated with reduced energy consumption, uh, with lower ecological footprints and, relief, and lower carbon emissions. And this holds for OECD countries, as well as at the state level, a recent paper that just came out in Social Forces uh, by Shore and Jorgensen and someone else showed that it holds at the state level in terms of the United States. Um, and also reduced energy consumption. And so if we significantly reduce work hours, we could have all these environmental gains. So why is that? Why, do, why does cutting working hours have ben significant benefits for the environment? Uh, one is it just reduces how much stuff we produce. And again, part of this, I think, would have to be some qualitative assessment of what kinds of things we should be producing. And that scares us because it sounds like a planned economy. And those didn't go so well. So it would have to be a different kind of economic planning, but we would have to have some sort of 
cooperative economic planning. Because most of the stuff we create today, I mean, just admit it, it's, it's, not, very, it's not very useful. It's just nonsense. Uh, and it actually makes you kind of miserable. You know, it's looking at your phone all the time. I do it too. It's not like I'm a brilliant person that's critiquing uh, people that live stupid lives or something. I do it too. I look at my phone all day. It makes you miserable. Research showed that, you know, if you're on Facebook all the time, it makes you more miserable. And I don't think you've become any happier, probably because you can check your email at home at night on Saturday. <laughs> uh, but there, there's a number of things we produce, I think we can all agree, are, are, are completely useless and don't make us any happier. So it'd be a qualitative assessment too. What kind of crap are we producing uh, and should we be producing it? And for whom? And then there's an indirect uh, cause. And this requires a lot more research. Is why, because it matters what we do during leisure time. You know, if everyone went on a, a, a vacation because there's less work, you, don't, you can see why this would be a problem. But if everyone had the time to start pursuing, you know, sustainable lifestyles, because adopting a green lifestyle takes a lot of time. So if someone's working like two 30-hour jobs in our, you know, flexible labor economy, uh, and if you tell them, hey, you should start riding your bike to work, they can just tell you, to, you know, screw you. <laughs> I'm not going to ride my bike to work. I don't have time. Um, or, and, and like, I'm part of this environmental organization. I'll criticize it briefly. In Cincinnati, we put on the Earth Fair, or the Earth Fair, Earth Day every year in Cincinnati. And then this year's theme is Farm Your Yard. Well, a lot of people don't have yards. Most people don't have time to farm their yard. So, it's, you know, there, there is this idea of changing individual lifestyles. This is going to solve the environmental problem. Uh, to do, but it's not the idea that making these changes that is wrong. It's that do we even have time to do it? And, uh, and how many people are doing it? Um, and then there's also so social benefits, and I'll, I'll probably wrap, I might, it's good for society too. I got, I got, I got five more minutes. But the, one of the, just briefly, one of the major social benefits of work time reduction is, is it's also used as a synonym for work sharing. You know, most people that are unemployed, uh, kind of, they do want to work, despite, you know, against popular belief, and they just can't find jobs, or at least lasting jobs. And, and part of that is structural. And we can talk about why that is later. But uh, reducing the work week means that more people can work. And that you have to be careful here, too, because if I'm working 50 hours a week and you're working zero hours a week, if we both start working 25 hours a week, that's not going to help anything. But if we both work, start working 20 hours a week, you start seeing different solutions here. And then also, the case for more autonomy. So mo professors are weird because we have jobs that we actually kind of like even though we always act busy and, and like, oh, today's stressful. But then for most people, you know, there's a study in the UK where a huge proportion of people thought that their jobs don't, didn't even need to exist. Have you seen that book, Bullshit Jobs? A lot of people just go to work and they don't think their job should exist. Every day they go to work to a job that they don't think should even exist. Uh, so, and the, the point I'm trying to make here is that where you find, professors are weird because we find autonomy and freedom in our work, but for most people that's not the case. And a lot of work, even in a post-growth society, would still suck. A lot of work sucks. So when, when you're not working, that's the time that you can really find the different, the different potentials that you have, figure out who you are, try new things, but it, of course it'd have to be sustainable activities. So one more slide and then I'll stop. And this is just one slide, but I think this is one of the most exciting climate change proposals. And if you already think I'm a communist or something, this will not help my case very much. Uh, but the, the case for nationalizing and decommissioning fossil fuel companies. Because if you think that fossil fuel companies are going to suddenly stop extracting fossil fuels and, and burning them, you're an idiot. <laughs> you know, if you think they're just going to do it on their own because they're nice guys or something, it's not going to happen. So we have to figure out how to how to make that happen. And this is part of the transitioning to renewables means making this go away. And one way to do it is to just uh, put it into public hands. Uh, and in the United States, it's a little more difficult to do because we have taking laws, but in the United States, we could set up a, a social energy fund that's been proposed by uh, Gowen, uh, and it would be a public fund to buy out uh, fossil fuel companies at market price, and then after we have a majority, uh, Shrink them, get rid of them, slowly. And one of the benefits is it would be a planned reduction of fossil fuel use while we transition to renewables, and all the people in the fossil fuel, in, uh, uh, in the fossil fuel industry that hate you 
because you want their jobs to go away, you would be actually be able to give them new jobs in renewable energy if you do this in a planned way. So the, I, I, I think this is one of the most exciting climate change policy proposals around, but it, deserves, it needs a lot more research. Uh, for instance, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to start a project where I interview uh, uh, CEOs and other senior managers of coal companies and see if they might just be interested. Because you might think that, of course, they're not going to be interested in this option, but a bunch of coal companies have claimed bankruptcy recently, and they might want out of the game. You know, how great would it be to get rid of coal? One way to do it is nationalizing uh, fossil fuel companies. So to briefly summarize, um, the, so again, I, I hope you don't go away from this thing that, oh, there's this weirdo from Miami of Ohio. He's not even from Florida. And he said, <laughs> and he said, he said that we shouldn't have technology. It's not going to help us uh, take care of climate change. But that's not the point. Uh, it, it's that we should stop thinking that technology is going to be some sort of savior, that we're just waiting around and pretty soon uh, if we, some smart people are working on renewables and everything's going to be okay. I think we should stop thinking like that. Because even with the really great renewables like wind and, uh, wind and uh, solar, that just developing those isn't going to solve the problem. And the way that I think we should start approaching the problem of climate change is how to reorganize uh, society in a way that we can increase social well-being, or at least maintain social well-being, uh, decrease the use of uh, uh, fossil fuels, and of course, maximize the gains of uh, alternative energy. And one really pernicious argument today, and we'll probably talk about during discussion, and I, I'm all, I also understand where the argument is coming from, is the idea that we have to be pragmatic. Hey, listen, I know that sounds like a great plan forward, but let's be realistic and get on with things. You know, we have to make, we have to figure out how to do this in a way that's realistic, that, that argument. And what that immediately means, in, means really is let's just keep the status quo going and just keep doing the same things that we've always been doing. And that's, that's what the argument is. And today, this isn't my quote, this is from this, this guy named Slavoj Žižek, but he says, uh, being, being uh, utopian today is actually just saying, let's just continue with the status quo. The idea that we can just keep doing what we're doing, that's a utopian idea. Because the future will be one that you don't want to live in uh, if we keep doing what we're doing. So being, being realistic is actually being what people usually say being utopian, is thinking about alternative social futures, how do we get there, what are the political barriers, and let's make it happen. Uh, I think that's more realistic than what's usually talked about. All right, I made it kind of in time. Yeah, it just, that would be a minor rebound effect. Okay. And the problem, the problem really, that's why I don't like the individual examples as much, especially consumer side ones, is the, pro, is the problem is when firms increase efficiency, what it means is they're just increasing profits. And if you're a firm and, and you're not an idiot, you, re, you just reinvest it. And that means producing more stuff. And so that, those are just, some are minor rebound effects. But a true, uh, what do they call them, backfire is when you have more in, uh, total increases in efficiency gain, in, in, in resource use due to increases in efficiency gains. So, so, the, so it could be, um, like it doesn't have to be the resources you're initially made more efficient. Say that again. Like the, like the total increase in consumption could be other things. It doesn't have to be the, well, the, does the paradox refer specifically to, you know, you're consuming oil, oil becomes cheap. Uh, the, the original term for the Jevons paradox means that. Right. But okay. since then, it's expanded to a bunch of different uh, avenues. And one is identifying indirect uh, problems with increases in other forms of resource use. Like a better example with the individual consumption size, it, it, side is when you save money and you spend it on something else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. gotcha. Yep. 
My, on the Green New Deal, th this will sound funny because you know the news frames is like, how preposterous this is radical, are you for it? Or, I, I think it's not radical enough because, and I say that because it doesn't say how we're gonna get off of fossil fuels. And the language it uses about reducing uh, uh, carbon emissions uh, leaves open a, a possibility for things like carbon markets, which do, don't work. Uh, but in term, without criticizing it though, I think it's the only realistic in terms of this kind of realism, realistic plan for climate change in the United States has ever been proposed. Yeah, that, yeah, I published an op-ed on the Green New Deal. And uh, our point is uh, we should be 100% uh, in support of the Green New Deal with, while pushing it, making it more radical over time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, something with the growth. Uh, keep going. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, that's right. The 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 response of degrowth, is, and sometimes when people talk about degrowth, like older uh, older ecologists that are like, uh, we've been talking about this for forty years. Like you're just restating everything we said in 1972, uh, and that went away. We talked about that went away. That that critique. What what is different about uh, D, and degrowth is consciously trying to to have some sort of re renaissance of old school radical ecology, but I think they're a bit smarter in terms of talking about population growth because since that time, like the population bomb, uh, we've been more. Mm, keen to what kind of humans are you talking about? Because my two kids are gonna be way worse for the environment than like 40 Indian kids that were born uh, in the last couple of seconds. Like w way worse. Uh, Cause they're gonna fly on airplanes across the, uh, the, the ocean, drive around all over the place. I drive into museums all the time. Uh, and th they're gonna be, mo they're monsters. <laughs> when it comes to the environment. Like their carbon footprint is gonna be gigantic. So the, it matters what kind of humans you're talking about, and then the distribution of population matters too. But yeah, I think overall, uh, there's certainly still a case to be made to fewer kids would be probably be a good thing. You know, carrying capacities is real, uh, I assume. <laughs> That'd be amazing if it wasn't, but I think uh, there's probably a carrying capacity. Right now, what is it estimated, like 10 billion, if everyone was a vegetarian and, and everything was equal? Like 10 billion, something like that. And so yeah, less kids would be probably a good idea. I already messed up. <laughs> I've got two. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you've talked about technology and why it cannot help us on its own. Uh, how do you suggest we approach the lay people? And the, the reason why I'm asking that is, as you just mentioned, we've been looking at how we can change behaviors in the 70s, 80s. We have a gazillion of theories from social psychology, psychology, sociology, uh, but none of them have actually uh, come up with, with plans. Uh -huh. I don't believe in anthropocentrism, which is a bad thing. But at the end of the day, we all do that for us. So how do you suggest we communicate that to the people? Yeah, how do you, how do you sell something like degrowth? <laughs> so part, part of it is mar how would you market it, or how would you change behavior? The problem I see with degrowth is that environmental organizations like Greenpeace and stuff, they sell that we should protect the environment for the panda or for the koala uh -huh. or whatever, right? But we are missing the big message there that we have to protect the environment for humans. 
Otherwise, I assume we're losing a big bottle there. Oh, how do you how do you make the case, the life support case? Uh, what so one problem with degrowth, at selling it to the public, is it's it's like there's no uglier word that could be more against every everyday thoughts about what what we should be doing. Well, like if it, if it, seriously imagine a politician being like, well, I'm planning to shrink the economy. <laughs> that person would get zero votes except for some. Uh, Maybe university professors, yeah, but I'd vote for them. Uh, but so how do, you, how do you sell it? So degrowth has a problem in sense that it's difficult to market due to deeply entrenched ideology. And I think calling it a growth fetish is actually fairly accurate. And in current, the, the, the kicker is it's not just ideology. Because in current structural conditions, you do have to grow. You have to grow the economy. And it is in your interest, because if it doesn't, you're screwed. Like if there's a recession, What's going to happen to your work? Indiana, they start cutting funding. Uh, sorry, the tax base is going out. We don't have your job here anymore, all that. It's bad for everyone. So you have to change the kind of economic conditions you live in. The, uh, on the other hand, so it's hard to sell that because of what it's called. On the other hand, the good thing about the term degrowth is uh, there's an op-ed written on it by, I, pro I can't even say the title because it has an F word in it. But it, it was degrowth is punk as, can I say the F word? There's no, degrowth is punk as fuck. That was the name of the op-ed, and it was it was written by uh, I, I don't I don't know how I feel about the article, but the point that they make is how I feel about the term degrowth and why I kind of like it is BP can't put degrowth on one of their uh, gas stations, but they can sure as hell put sustainable development on it. You know, it's one term that you can't recuperate because it's so unsexy. It's it's saying we need to reduce total throughput. You can't you can't make that into something that sounds slick for, you know, to be greenwashed, whatever. Um, but selling it to the public is a question that uh, I'm interested. I was going to, I actually had a research project you would have really liked, but I'm doing it with undergrads, and they're all seniors. They all have senioritis, and they graduate almost immediately. So just, I've had like four students interviewing other students, and then they just stop communicating through email when they graduate. So I don't think that project will happen. But the, long story short, there is a way to frame degrowth, and that's that growth one, re it doesn't make us happier, or healthier, and that's what people actually care about. And most people know that living in a consumer society makes a lot of them pretty miserable. I mean, you could just, uh, something like, uh, and I'm not, this is terrible social science, I'm not saying that these are directly causal, but the idea that modern societies are happier due to growth is just immediately disproven by uh, how many people are on pills. And I know that, uh, Part of this is uh, personal issues, part is biology, but if, if something like a quarter of American women are taking pills to be able to get out of bed, that tells you that you live in a miserable society. You know, the, the sociologist, have you heard of Emile Durkheim? He said that utilitarians are completely wrong in thinking that modern societies are making us happier. You know, the, the common argument was if we keep develop, development going, uh, we increase pleasure and we become happier because of suicide rates increase. And if, if, if there's any sort of proxy measure for uh, living in a society that doesn't make people happy, it's just that people kill themselves. Uh, and today, I think uh, proxy measure is just the rate of, uh, and of course, part of it is biological, part of it is personal, it's not, uh, is the rate of how many people rely on pills for anxiety and depression. So this kind of society doesn't make people happy. I mean, you can be happy in this society, but it's, it's not, there's no direct mechanism of, of producing and consuming a bunch of stuff that no one wants. And I think, one more thing I'd say, I don't know if this will sell to the public, but just a brief soap, uh, soapbox message, is think, one way to think about late capitalism is how many people are, are employed in marketing? And we just take it for granted, because you know, it's, it's, it's part of our second nature to drive around and see billboards and stuff. People are producing things and then literally have to pay billions and billions of dollars to marketers to get you to want it. You know, you read Onion, have you seen, you know, the, you read The Onion? There's one of my favorite Onion pieces is the, the existence of uh, edible, uh, edible arrangements disproves all economic theory. You know, it's the stupidest thing you've ever seen is, you know, have you seen edible arrangements? It's fruit that's cut up like flowers, and you buy it, and then you put it in your mouth and chew on it and eat it. It's, it's moronic. 
And to sell something like that, uh, you have to try really hard. That's a silly example, but you get the picture. Am I rambling too much? What other questions do you have? Yeah. Are we, you know, are you doing a bit of end around or like, are we just, are we sort of not, are we dancing around the real issue instead of getting right at it? In environmentalism? Yeah. I think so. You know, because people are scared to say capitalism. <laughs> I, think, I think, I think starting to talk about capitalism is essential because it is ubiquitous. It's everything. Uh, the the way that you think, uh, your the your, the myths you live by, what you do with your everyday life, what you do in leisure. So when I when I don't know about you guys, when I'm off work, I just go home and start consuming stuff almost immediately. And then I go consume stuff with my kids. Hey, look at that! Let, you know, let's go get ice cream and then go to the museum, stare at that for a while. Oh, here's a screen. You know, and I'll stare at my screen while you're looking at yours. And that and then when I go to work, I have work so I can obviously have a paycheck. But I also I like my job, unlike most people. Um, and that, that structures everything. My everyday life is 100% uh, conditioned by, not necessarily determined by, economic system. And something to touch on this other scary word, Marx, one of the insights that's really misunderstood about Marx is that he, the idea that um, any economic system determines social life. Uh, and there's some level that that's true in the sense that you have to produce and consume things to have a, a social organization. But what he was actually arguing, especially in his late work, is that the, the very unique thing about capitalism is that it's, for the first time, the economic system really does determine social life. And people like Polanyi, a different economist, talked about it as a disembedding of society from markets, where, where markets become autonomous. You know, in, in like feudal times, there's like a, a notion of a fair price, social relations, uh, uh, regulated economic interaction, those kinds of things. In capitalism, everything is your personal opinion, except how much that thing costs. And maybe you can haggle in the market if, if you're in the right country. But the only, and the only thing that really matters, you know, during policy discussions, everyone pretends, you know, there's a lot of moral posturing. Oh, you make me so mad. You, this is an outrage that you can say things like that. But everyone's just waiting for someone to say, well, how much does this thing cost? Uh, is it going to raise taxes? Uh, yeah, let's not do that. That's a, that's so. And that our society is unique because of the way that we organize the economy. Yeah. Yep. I was just talking to a friend this morning about that quote. It becomes truer every day. It's because that Vox article I mentioned. I'm serious. Vox is like the the cool news, when you watch, you're like, oh, Vox, they have a slick video. They have geoengineering, and they're, th these David Keith and this other guy from Harvard are talking about solar geoengineering as if it's like applying a medicine of some kind. We need the right dose. This isn't a perfect analogy, but you can think about stratospheric aerosols this way. And so it's, it's easier to imagine, or going to Mars. You know, like the, the what is that guy, Elon Musk? Like, hey, let's plan going to Mars. You're like, hey, that sounds like a good, that seems reasonable. But if someone says we should produce and consume a little less crap, it's like, what is that? That's it. That's a, the silliest idea I've ever heard. That's not even a viable option. I was, I was planning on going to Mars and having McDonald's. Right? So I think, uh, yeah, I think that becomes truer every day. Is it's, easier, it's easier to imagine, like, implementing these climate engineering strategies that could be catastrophic than just, like, switching economic systems around a little bit. The, Jameson and Zizek both talked about it. It's, it's perfect. It's perfect. It's perfect. Did you hear the quote? It's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Much easier. That's why I think this climate fiction is so popular today. It's, and like ideas of, uh, uh, and even one reason I think the degrowth movement is, is somewhat 
uh, resonates with some people is people are just fed up with contemporary society. Is it? And it'd be better if the contemporary world just kind of ended. I think that, and if you talk to young people today, most of them, if, I mean, if you talk deeply with them, which they're not always uh, willing to do, all, a lot of them are just convinced the future is going to be uh, horrible. Like the sense that something terrible is around the corner is, um, uh, is very prevalent among uh, uh, young people. And it's usually not, okay, let's, let's develop a new economic system. It's like, you know, in the EU, the United States, there's a huge uh, rise in right-wing populism. No one's doing anything serious about the climate crisis. And, uh, and then flexible labor markets. I mean, you can, you can have a master's in environmental science and go work at Starbucks if you're lucky. So the, the combination of those things is, that's one reason I, I don't, like I said, if I was a betting person, I'd, I'd bet for a, a much worse future than the possibility of degrowth. But it's still a possibility now. But in like 20 years, it's over. I think though I, I think those maybe those uh, sentiments come together a lot of times like periods of rapid social change you know if you uh, what is the French period called what's the French word for the the turn of the century the fin, fin del sequa is that what it is something like it sounds right you guys don't know so that's right uh, that there was something similar to these this modern age and there's a sociologist that compares these two periods where there's really rapid social change and there's a lot of radical ideas floating around as well as a bunch of people that were just extremely pessimistic and cynical and thought that the, it'd be better if humans didn't even exist and i think those sentiments coexist a lot due to rapid social change and not knowing what the future holds because when the, when things change like this we actually do have an opportunity to fundamentally change things for the better more likely, it seems like to me, and I, I think young, it seems like young people, maybe I'm talking to the wrong ones, also are a little nervous about the, what could, what can happen, what's right around the corner. Uh -uh. What's his name? Uh -uh. Dark ecology? Uh -uh. Awesome. Yeah, will you email it to me? Cool. Perfect. Thank you so much, Brian. Oh, thank you for coming.